Good morning. I'm going to share my screen. And I am so delighted to be with you and have this opportunity to kind of talk to you about all the wonderful resources that we have at NFPA. Um, I wanted to start out as we were kind of, this is a really busy week, so I wanted to thank you for being a part of this webinar. And also, um, of course, St. Patrick's Day is coming up, and I wanted to say happy St. Patty's. Um, everybody I know is preparing for Friday here for St. Patrick's Day. And then also, um, it's a big day in the U.S. because Ted Lasso is actually streaming starting today. And so we are learning a little bit about football, not the football like with us, but your football. And so I wanted to say um, in a funny way that it's kind of a big day in the U.S. for us. And my husband and I um, always watch it. And I'm from North Carolina. And here we have biscuits, but not the same as your biscuits. So um, we have a lot in common, but a little bit of differences. So we'll get started. I wanted to talk to you about um, carbon monoxide resources and also other resources that we have here at NFPA. Um, we have so many of them that I was super excited to have the opportunity to talk to you. And I told you it was a big week. It's also a big week because Sparky the fire dog actually turned 72 on Saturday. Now, there's a lot of speculation on why March 18th was his birthday. Somebody either had a really good time on St. Patrick's Day and dreamed him up, or it's just by chance. But we are preparing to celebrate the original Sparky the fire dog and all the resources that he puts out there. And so I hope um, if you have the opportunity and many of you are from the fire service and even our community partners that you'll help us celebrate and you can certainly go to Sparky the Fire Dog on social media and see those. And also we have a website and I wanted to mention because we were talking about resources, um, certainly resources also revolve around for children. And so we do have a kid-based site, which is ad-free. And so um, you can access sparky.org and share it with your school age groups. And that is safe content. And you'll see on here, learn the sounds of fire safety. And we actually talk about the difference between sounds that smoke alarms and CO alarms make. And we have lots of tools for that. So this is a great page. Um, this QR code will take you to it, but sparky.org. And then also for educators, and if you have access to schools and after school programs, um, and even for you to find content, you can actually go to sparkyschoolhouse.org. And on there, we have lesson plans, we have ebooks, we have videos, and all of that is free for you to use. And even Learn Not to Burn. So, Learn Not to Burn was the original fire safety program. And in that, it will talk about smoke alarms. CO alarms, and it will give you age-specific content. So it goes preschool up to grade two and learn not to burn, but we have lesson plans and videos that can be used um, all the way up to adults that are showcased on sparkyschoolhouse.org. So I did want to mention that because that's a little different than what I would prevent, present to you in the normal resources around carbon monoxide that we offer. And of course, I have to uh, mention to you that NFPA, um, just during COVID, we actually celebrated our 125th anniversary. Um, we started in 1896, and hopefully you know about the National Fire Protection Association. Our website is nfpa.org. And so I hope you bookmark that. And since we are an international um, self-funded not-for-profit, we have resources that anyone can use free. And I'm so proud of that tradition of safety. We're committed to preventing losses in that fire and burn space. We talk about building codes, excuse me. <clears throat> we talk about building codes. We talk about how to keep people safe, but it's a wonderful tradition that we have. And then last year in October, we actually celebrated the 100th anniversary of Fire Prevention Week. And this is the longest running health and safety observance on record here in the US. But we know that our international partners also celebrate Fire Prevention Week with us. And so it was super exciting to see that we have all rallied around one week a year that we make sure we all put out educational messaging. And so I wanted to make sure you had access to that. This year, we used a theme called Fire Won't Wait, Plan Your Escape. And that is because here in the U.S., you're more likely to die 
in a home fire now than you were 40 years ago. We have less fires, but unfortunately, if you have a fire in your home, you're more likely to die. And so we put together the campaign around making sure that you had an escape plan, that you have two ways out of every room, that you have working smoke alarms, and then we concentrated on some specialties. And so people with disabilities, we want to plan for their abilities. And also you see in the second picture that there's some pets there. We know that pets are part of the family and we're making sure that people have a plan for their pets. And if their pets aren't able to evacuate with them, that they stay out of the home and they notify the firefighters that there's a pet inside. And then lastly here, Many people do not have a landline. So if I were to say that, it would be a home phone. Many of them only have cell phones or mobile phones. So we started talking about how to call 911, which is our emergency number across the United States, how to do that from a mobile phone. Because mobile phones that have password protection, <clears throat> sometimes people don't know that every mobile phone has a way to bypass the password and do make an emergency call. So we have a lesson plan that actually talks about that. And so you can see the campaign focused around some of the things that we're seeing since Fire Prevention Week started. Also, I'm at NFPA, we talk about how fire safety and, and even CO, CO poisoning can fit into our fire and life safety ecosystem. So within every environment, whether it's the Amazon, if you're in the UK or here in the US, there is a ecosystem that exists in nature, but there's also one in that fire and life safety space. So we know that um, each cog of this wheel that you see here plays a part in it. And many of you are involved in that um, because of your role. So whether you're in government and you know people assume that government's responsibility is to keep us safe, if you're on the inside of that, you know that sometimes it's very tricky and we ask for things um, to enhance safety, but it may not always happen. We talk about the use of codes and um, the adoption of codes. And certainly NFPA is very proud that some places adopt NFPA 1 and 101, which is our life safety codes. Um, that NFPA 72 talks about smoke alarms and CO alarms. And that was a change that happened. And then um, also that investment in safety. How do we get people to make a choice up front to invest in safety rather than waiting for a disaster? And one of the analogies we use is, you know, having people go ahead if they have any fossil fuel burning appliance, if they have an attached garage to have a working CO alarm instead of waiting until a tragedy happens that you hear about. And then of course, a skilled workforce, how do we make sure that people that are doing some of our um, skills for electrical, um, heating and air, plumbing, that they are going through certification and that they have a um, specialized skill that is regulated instead of just my cousin does this work on the side. And then code compliance, certainly having fire inspections that occur is a vital part of this making sure that we have checks and balances. And then emergency preparedness, um, whether it be inclement weather or a um, natural disaster, or even if it's a man-made disaster like an active shooter or a hostile event. Unfortunately, there are so many things that happen. This right now, I think this morning I saw there was um, civil unrest going on in Pakistan because of something going on, but certainly all of our countries are impacted by these events. And then lastly is the inform, inform public. And that is that we have got to do a better job of informing the public of how they take ownership and make themselves safer. So maybe um, making sure that they have working smoke alarms. Even though we do a good job of trying to reach every home, we need people to be safety minded and to take responsibility for their personal safety and things that can keep them safe. And so um, let's dive right into carbon monoxide. NFPA has um, what I talked about, our original NFPA, which is the organization that develops codes and standards. 
We have outreach and advocacy, which is the section I'm in. And then we have a research foundation. So we have a separate 501c3. That is our NFPA Fire Protection Research Foundation. And as part of that, they're a neutral entity. And the way that they look at data is they take everyone's research and they generate reports from it. So one of those reports was around carbon monoxide detection and alarm requirements. What is going on with that? What are we seeing? Where are we doing good things? Where do we see improvements? And this ties into the National Carbon Monoxide Awareness Association and how they're partnering across all the many disciplines to bring us to the table and really make a difference. Now, in full disclosure, Adrian mentioned it, but carbon monoxide is really a passion project of mine. I travel with a CO alarm in my suitcase. Um, I do that because um, for a long time, I have learned and read about carbon monoxide, and we are trying to do a better job of educating the fire service about the dangers of CO, just like we have with fire. Today, I'll be on a firefighter curriculum committee for the rest of the afternoon I'm on a virtual meeting because we've got to do a better job. And you can see that um, we only have a little bit of data in the U.S. that talks about um, carbon monoxide deaths. We do not have a great reporting system. And I live, like I said, in North Carolina. So that's in the southern part of the U.S. And you can see that we have um, one of the highest percentages of CO death compared to the U.S. as a whole. And then unfortunately, um, that 45 to 54 age bracket has the most um, CO fatalities when we look at it here in the US, but we, have, we are working with many national partners to try to get better research on this. So when we talk about carbon monoxide at NFPA, we have got to talk about some of the unusual places that CO poisoning can occur. So I'm gonna take you through some of the normal ones and where we have messaging around carbon monoxide, but also um, there has been a lot of media around um, some of these emerging issues. So here in the US and I'm sure in the UK, um, people use vacation rentals. So there are many names for that. We call it peer-to-peer -peer hospitality, where instead of staying in a hotel, they may actually stay um, or rent out someone's home. And unfortunately here, one of the actresses Actually, her whole family was sickened by CO. They rented a home in Lake Tahoe, which is in the northwest uh, portion of the United States, and they were sickened during spring break because of a CO leak that occurred in a condo that they were renting. And then, unfortunately, the picture at the bottom is a family that traveled to Mexico. They rented a condo, and they had a gas water heater in this condominium, and they actually were killed also from CO poisoning. And so we know that everyone has to be alert around your vacations, around your business travel with your family in general, and really push the word out that you have to become your own advocate. That is why um, we always travel with a CO alarm. And um, you can't always rely on the fact that a code or standard is in place that requires it. The other emerging issue is keyless cars. Um, here in the US, and I know um, in the UK, um, we have for many years had a key that you stuck in the ignition, cranked a car, and that's how you started it. But the technology has evolved to where I can actually have my keys now and push a button. So one of the hazards that has evolved is that with keyless cars, people sometimes will go to lock their vehicle in their garage, but they may mistakenly self-start their vehicle by pushing a button on their remote. Another thing is with senior adults. Senior adults have muscle memory of sticking a key into the ignition and turning it. When you change that up and they're changing their behavior that they've done for 20, 30, 60 years, um, unfortunately, in their mind, since they don't physically have a key, we've seen some communities in Florida that uh, senior adults have actually left their car running because they're so quiet. They may have a hearing impairment and they close their garage, but their vehicle is actually still running. And so this is a very complex issue 
that we continue to follow, but it's one that I hope that you're thinking about in your communities is doing some awareness about putting layers of protection in place. And then of course here, um, we have also launched, um, I am not proud of the fact that here in my home state, which is North Carolina, we had a hotel and actually three people lost their life in one hotel room on two separate incidents. So the first fatality occurred with the Jenkins family and their picture um, right here, you'll see the, the lovely woman and man there, that's the Jenkins family. They actually checked into this hotel and they were later found dead when they didn't check out. And at that time, they went to the medical examiner's office. No one had the wherewithal to even think, you know, they just assumed they died. We know so much more now. So after a while, they kept, um, they, they had this room closed off and then they allowed it to be rented again. And at that time, um, a mother and her son, the Williams family checked in. And at that time, they um, actually, the mother went to take a shower. Her name is Jeannie. And um, when she did, um, she fell sick in the bathroom. And her son, Jeffrey, actually died from CO poisoning. And at that time, when EMS was called, Jeannie was still alive. And one of the um, folks that came to that call said, wait a minute, something is going on here. And as a result of that, they started checking for carbon monoxide and started putting two and two together that, oh my gracious, there is something going on here. And what happened is there was a malfunctioning pool heater that had come dislodged and was actually feeding into the room that they were staying in in that hotel. So it was a pool heater in a hotel that actually poisoned those three people and they lost their lives. As a result of that, um, we did an analysis of this with my local code officials here, and we looked at all the different failures in the system. There were so many places that things were missed. And as a result of that, a law was passed here in North Carolina that required um, any rooms that were adjacent to something that fed from a fossil fuel burning appliance, that they would have CO alarms. So out of tragedy, there are many times code changes. And so that is just one example of um, a failure in our system. Um, certainly, I'm kind of talking to um, the, the rock stars of this. If you're on this webinar, you know about all the different sources of CO, whether it could be a vehicle. It can always be from your water heater or a furnace. It could be from your dryer that we have this. Um, certainly if you have gas appliances um, in here. And then as I mentioned in hotels, we see carbon monoxide generated from either gas dryers, clothes dryers. So they're doing laundry for all these rooms or even pool heaters. So it certainly is something to be thinking about outreach in your community around these, these one-off areas that you may not have worked on. And then here, um, and nationally, we are also looking at what is going on and what are some emerging issues around carbon monoxide. Um, one of those is our fire inspectors are actually telling us that um, we're encouraging inspectors to always have a portable CO meter on detector on their belt. And at our summits that we offer, um, we have actually had saves where they have gone into an industrial setting into a company and they're using one of these um, forklifts that's actually using um, a gas powered forklift. And when they walked in, their CO and detectors have gone off and actually the employees were getting low levels and sometimes high level levels of CO poisoning. And so we're encouraging fire inspectors to always have a CO detector on their belt when they go and do inspections. And, and we're seeing huge returns on this. They've even gone to eat lunch at a restaurant. Um, I'll give you an example. We have a food chain called Cracker Barrel. If you've ever seen one, uh, they're from Tennessee and they have like country cooking. But in the restaurants, they have a beautiful fireplace, wood burning fireplace. And so um, they used to put flutes, which are covers over the chimneys. But now in some places they don't do that. And so during the summer months, they have actually been putting insulation inside the tops of the chimneys. Well, then someone has to take that out 
when you get ready to light these fires. Well, if you have a manager change, that information may be not realized. So we have a place called Pinehurst, which is where um, the U.S. Open, if you got any golfers on this uh, webinar, you'll know that the U.S. Open is held in Pinehurst. It's a very historic golfing community here. And so the U.S. Open is held there, but the fire inspectors went in and actually people, the waitresses were sick, customers were sick, and it was because they had lit the fire in the fireplace, but never taken the insulation out of the chimney. So you just never know when these kinds of hazards may exist. And then another thing that the fire service is seeing is they're seeing that in a lot of places, they may have golf carts that are being charged inside. And if they have a CO alarm, in some cases, if they're charging golf carts inside their garages, it is setting off their CO alarm. And so we've had many discussions around this because actually it's hydrogen gas that's being offloaded from this battery charging inside, but it will actually set off and cause false alarms. And so we have many golf cart communities. One is called the Villages in Florida. They have thousands. It's a senior adult community, but they have thousands of golf carts there. And so this is one of those emerging issues that originally they thought it was carbon monoxide that was being produced, but it's actually hydrogen gas. And so it's an issue that can mimic CO but is not actually carbon monoxide. And so here in North Carolina, we have um, Duke, Duke Hospital. Um, this is, um, we're really known for our basketball, <laughs> um, but they have a wonderful medical center. And there they're doing a lot of research around hyperbaric um, treat, treatment for carbon monoxide, um, people that have been exposed to it. And so they are one of the leaders, even nationally, that we're seeing that is looking at carbon monoxide poisoning and what are the best treatments for that. So I just wanted to mention, it's just ironic uh, that it's in my home state that this is occurring. And then um, during COVID um, here and also abroad, many people were driven outside to eat. And sometimes that has continued that we've converted outdoor space for heating, I mean, for eating all year long. Well, um, today is one of those chilly days. We're in the 40s, which is really cold for us. We were 70 last week. We're 40 today. But you'll see that these patio heaters are becoming a standard thing in restaurants. And so they'll sometimes be outside, but sometimes they close in areas that have these outdoor heaters. And you hope that our fire inspectors catch it, but they may not know. So NFPA actually launched a safety fact sheet around outdoor heating safety. And as part of that, we talk about carbon monoxide. We talk about usage of them. And I just wanted to make sure you knew about that resource. It is on our webpage. So if you go to nfpa.org, in the search bar, put outdoor patio heaters, and it will pull up this fact sheet that talks about um, what we're seeing and the fact that um, we need to be aware of carbon monoxide dangers that can occur if you're using these outdoor heaters and to make you aware of it. Uh, at NFPA, we create what's called an educational messaging document. And this is for anyone that is doing messaging. So whether you're from where I'm from or where you're from, this is a great booklet that's free online that talks about um, regardless of our accents and how we talk a little different from each other, we should be using the same words when we talk about subjects. And so this is actually a free publication that NFPA creates. Uh, these are all the different chapters that exist. And you'll see that um, the third chapter is actually on carbon monoxide. And then we have specialty chapters that look at all different types of hazards and then messaging that should go along with that. And so I thought I would take you through a few of those resources so that you could see it. And first I wanted to show you where to find it. So if you go to nfpa.org, when you go to our webpage, you'll see public education. And if you click that tab, you will find a line that says educational messaging. So uh, it is a free download. Go to educational messaging, and when you come to the page, it looks like this. 
it gives you the chance to download this desk reference. And when you click to download the desk reference, it will say, hey, would you like more resources around public education? Um, do you wanna get our newsletters? And you can pick what things you like, or you can just download the document. I actually have one and I always keep it because um, I have a printed copy that I use. And I have this available because I check myself each time that I put together messaging to make sure that I'm using the proper messaging. So the way you use it is um, they're divided up into chapters. We want you to read the entire chapter around a subject, and then you can pick and choose which messages fit your community. And so it's just a resource for you. And I thought since we were talking about carbon monoxide resources that I would show you kind of some of the areas that we have things for. The other thing is that you're, you're able to comment on the educational messaging document. This little diagram shows you that when we actually produce the booklet and the download, that's the tip of the iceberg. But we take public comment for folks in between the cycles and we're getting ready to do a new version. This is the 2020 version, but we'll be doing a new version that will come out at the end of um, 2023 or the beginning of 24. We didn't have as many comments as we traditionally do, but we've been following new technology and things that are evolving. And so what we do is we actually take the comments that come in, we look at it in the lens of the codes and standards and make sure that it follows the codes and standards process and that it's technically correct by our technical experts. Then we look at the educational messaging of it, make sure that the readability is appropriate. And then that message is either accepted, it's actually um, not accepted, or modified, and we let people know through a report if a message was accepted, not accepted, or modified, and why. So it is worth your time to submit a comment to the educational messaging document group, and you'll find this online at the same page where we just were at nfpa.org. Now, within this document, we have uh, generator safety, and currently it's listed as portable generators, but one of the things that's occurred is that we've had many hurricanes that have hit the lower part of the U.S. and the East Coast where I am, and when one of the hurricanes hit uh, two years ago in Louisiana, uh, as a result of that, more and more people have fixed generators. And what we found is that the spacing distance from where those generators had to be installed, um, many of the codes had not addressed that. And what was happening is if a generator runs for a couple of hours, that's one amount of CO that's, that's created. But when a generator runs for seven, 14, 28 days, you can imagine if there were multiple generators running, the amount of carbon monoxide, if you don't have spacing that's generated. As a result of that, in spite of them being placed correctly, the CO was in such high amounts because it ran infinitely that CO was being absorbed through soffits and underpinning of, of houses. And so this is being re-looked at from a codes and standards perspective by uh, UL, which is a listing agency here in the US and by our Consumer Product Safety Commission. That is here in the US and they have ultimate responsibility over carbon monoxide as a federal agency. But we talk about portable generators, the fact that they should be 20 feet from doors, windows and openings. We talk about if you rent equipment, the safety around it, and then also about where you as a person is situated in relation to that generator. So this is within chapter three. We also talk about, um, we talk about homes, and that would be um, things like heating that's going to be appliances, but also we talk about, and this was added new, was around boating and marinas. So it's been very ironic that in places that have um, a lot of open water, so that would be lakes and oceans, um, we have ponds, we have all kinds of water around here. But as a result of that, people were actually dying and they were swimming behind boats. And so people assumed they drowned 
But when they did autopsies, they were actually being poisoned by carbon monoxide because people were leaving their boats running while people were swimming behind them. And so this is an emerging thing, which is we wanna make sure people know about electrical safety around marinas and boating, but also about carbon monoxide safety around boats and marinas. And so this is a new topic that was added. And um, we talk about how CO alarms are one way and the way that you can protect you and your family. So we want to make sure people aren't swimming when they have them. If you have a boat um, with indoor compartments, that you make sure that you have a CO alarm and that you test it, that it's from a qualified testing lab, and that if it sounds to make sure to move to fresh air. The other chapter that we added was within hotels and motels, we added a whole section around carbon monoxide. And that is if you um, choose a hotel or motel to make sure that they have both smoke alarms and CO alarms, as well as a fire sprinkler, um, fire sprinkler system. So we used to talk about smoke alarms. We even talked about sprinklers and how you needed to choose a hotel or motel with that. But now we have included CO alarms. And we also state that if they don't have one, a travel CO alarm is always a good option to have those. And if you take nothing else away from this webinar, I ask you just personally to please protect you and your family and make sure that you have one of these CO alarms that can travel with you when you go on vacation. You protect people every day, but at the end of the day, I want to make sure you're protected and that we share that message. And then um, we mentioned about fire safety and your home away from home, um, certainly peer-to-peer -peer hospitality services such as Airbnb and vacation rental by owner and other types. Um, some of the safety guidelines that we want to talk about are the fact that you need to make sure that they have working smoke alarms, also that you have CO alarms, and you can always carry one with you for that, um, that you have two ways out, but we included some carbon monoxide messaging in that, and then also motor homes and campers. Um, we saw a huge increase in people um, using motor homes and campers, and you may have seen the same thing. We have beautiful state parks here. And as part of that, we know that people need to be aware of the dangers of CO that can be produced with different appliances and also from the vehicle with this. And so we made sure to include some messaging around um, carbon monoxides when we talk about motor homes, um, having their appliances inspected, and then making sure that that vehicle is serviced because of that exhaust. And so this is a new topic that when you talk about carbon monoxide, it's not a very typical one. But be thinking about um, alternative ways to vacation and also how to keep people safe. And of course, they use heaters and lanterns and campfires, and we want to talk about safety around that as well. And then, of course, um, chapter 10 of our educational messaging is around fuel burning space heaters. Um, we have what are called unvented gas fired space heaters, and these are getting lots and lots of attention. They do have a sensor on them that detects when there's lower oxygen. But we also make sure that people do have carbon monoxide alarms in their home, that you wanna make sure that if you're using emergency heat, that it is a vented gas heater, that your wood stove is vented, um, and that you use electric heat for a prolonged time if you, if you have to, because of the hazards that can be occur from these fossil fuel burning space heaters. And then we have a whole web page that includes safety tip sheets. So I just gave you a little look at some of the areas where we have carbon monoxide messaging. But we also have many free safety tip sheets. Um, this little QR code, if you just take a picture of it, it'll take you to the web page. You can download our, car our um, safety tip sheets free. And you can use them all over the world. And we're so tickled that you can do that. And you can put their, your name here and your contact information. You can add in your logo. And NFPA wants you to co-brand with us. So we are super excited to make sure that you knew about these safety tip sheets. Um, there's actually more than 60 of them. So you could put, there's 52 weeks in a year. So this gives you something to put out every week that is free to kind of talk about safety 
all types of safety that are out there. If you're only interested in carbon monoxide, you can see that these are just three of the ones that address carbon monoxide hazards, and you can always put some specific messaging with that. And then we know that people need lots of translations. And so we do have some limited translations. And then we have what is called easy to read. And these easy to read tip sheets are just a series of pictures with limited words that talk about different topics. Now we get this question a lot. Do you have translation for everything? We don't. And I tell people that actually we have an even better option than any of these translated flyers or even are easy to read. And so I'm going to show you where those resources are because it's um, a super exciting way of talking to people about safety. But we do have some translations. So when you go to the safety tip sheet page, so when you go to nfpa.org, you can put in the search bar safety tip sheets and it'll take you to the page at the bottom of it. It will show you our translations and our easy to read. And then we do have what are called community toolkits. So if you've ever thought about, could I do a campaign around um, CO alarms? We have a free toolkit online and it's called Keeping Your Community Safe with CO Alarms. And it has fast facts. It has some beautiful um, pictures and graphics. It has news releases. It has um, talking points. But if you've ever thought about doing a carbon monoxide alarm campaign, this is a great way to use resources and it is free on our webpage. Um, if you just go to public education, you'll see community toolkits and that's where you'll find it. But it's a great way to, to get all things in one place around educating on carbon monoxide alarms. And then we also have lesson plans available. So these are little 10 minute lessons. So people have a very limited attention span. This is gonna be for adult learners. So if you've ever thought about doing some education around carbon monoxide for adults, this little 10 minute lesson is a great way for you to talk to elected officials and other community events and people about carbon monoxide alarms in homes. It gives you everything you need to talk to them about CO. It tells you where the educational messaging came from. And you'll see this little canary. Um, as you know, canaries were used for a long time, bless their little hearts. Um, they were the sacrificial thing that went into the coal mine to tell us whether or not CO was, was there. And so um, we use that as kind of a plug to kind of talk about the issue that some people may know about. And then we have an additional lesson plan on preventing CO poisoning. It is also a 10 minute lesson. It's great for your parent teacher groups. It's great for any community group to talk about what is carbon monoxide, um, how is it generated and what is it? And we have lots and lots of tools to use along with that. And then um, I'm, I hope my sound works, but we even have a sound bite. Hopefully you were able to hear that. If not, it's like tweet, 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 tweet. It's a canary that's in there. And um, we talk about the canary in the coal mine and we use that as kind of a, a start to the story and how things have progressed. And now we have CO alarms in a way that can actually help us to know if there are lethal levels of carbon monoxide. Uh, we do have lots of social media posts that you can grab, share, use. And we ask you to please um, follow the National Fire Protection Association and also Sparky the Fire Dog. There's two different ones. Um, both of these are on all the different social media platforms. So we are on LinkedIn. We are on um, Twitter. We are on Facebook. And um, so all of these are available to you. And we hope that you will sign up and follow us. And then we have lots of social media cards. So I wanted to mention this because many of you are out there using social media. So our partners in the US, now I know you're in the UK and some of you are all over the world, but hey, add your logo to these and use them. But the US Fire Administration actually is the, the folks here in the US that generate the best social media cards. They're interactive. And since we're talking about carbon monoxide, 
you can actually grab these social media cards. When you go to um, the U.S. Fire Administration, just Google it and click on working with the media. And when you do that, you'll see all these beautiful social media cards. And you can add your logo right here and partner with us in this outreach, but they have great social media cards. And then I mentioned to you about we never have all the different types of translations. So one of the things that the airline industry did many years ago is they actually have um, instructions for emergencies on airplanes with just pictures. They were really ahead of their time, but we actually know that pictographs are a great way to tell a story with not really any words, just telling people the story with pictures. So this little QR code will take you to the pictograph page. Uh, again, this is the US Fire Administration, but they are evergreen and can be used all over the world. And so you'll see that they tell the story about you need to test your CO alarms, check, pick a day, actually test them, and then every month, you should test your CO alarms. And then also they talk about the fact that if you have uh, snow, making sure that your uh, dryer pipes are not obstructed by snow. So this is a no-no, but this is good. Also that there's no debris in your chimney. And they show you just in a matter of pictures how to tell these stories. And these are all free for you to use. And then of course, generators, talking about the fact that when you have generators having a safe distance from your home, never running generators inside, and also never leaving your generators running inside a garage, even if the door is up. So you can see this tells the story just with pictures and limited words. And then the fact that carbon monoxide alarms, carbon monoxide is deadly. Of course, this universal symbol we want you to have a CO alarm outside each bedroom and on each level of your home. And we want you to test them. And so they're great to tell the story of what we're trying. And I hope you're excited about those resources. And then at NFPA, we have lots of ways for you to stay up to date all the time. So no matter where you are, you can always learn something new. And we have a YouTube channel. And on that YouTube channel, we talk about emerging hazards. We have several videos that talk about carbon monoxide. They talk about world events that have happened like the Beirut explosion. Um, we've talked about, there was a social media um, post going around that actually hand sanitizer would self-ignite. And we actually did a Mythbusters thing where we told them why that's not actually happening. And then we have the NFPA journal. Uh, you can access our journal online. So when you go to nfpa.org and at the top you click NFPA journal, it's actually a reader just like a book. And you can keep up with all things that occur um, with NFPA and many emerging hazards. So one of the last one was on firefighting foam. Um, foam, of course, um, one of the topics here in the U.S. is that PFAS is generated from foam that firefighters have been using and that can um, actually contaminate our water. And so uh, that is an emerging issue, but there are many, many topics that may be of interest to you, but also many articles around carbon monoxide. And then we have an NFPA podcast that's available for free from our website or any of the listening platforms. So if you do um, any podcast platform, you can access it. It's called the NFPA podcast. We do a couple of those every month that come out, but they are a great way for you to stay connected with us at NFPA. And then we have a free video library and you can go in on our webpage. If you go to nfpa.org and click on public education, you'll see our video library. Also NFPA Kids is a YouTube channel that has all of our videos on it. And then um, we also have just our regular YouTube channel that you can access all kinds of safety messaging, especially around even some carbon monoxide ones. But all of those are free and you can use them with your educational campaigns. And then we have the NFBA conference. Uh, this year we're in a little place called Las Vegas. And I'm not sure if you've heard of that. I'm just kidding. Um, we are actually in Las Vegas, which is on the West Coast of the US and our conference is an amazing international conference. And so I wanted to make sure to mention to you that we would love to have you come over 
for our conference. Uh, this QR code will take you to the registration page. The dates are right here. And for all the fathers that are on the call, I'm so sorry that our conference hits right at Father's Day, but it might be a great way for you to spend Father's Day is to come to our conference. Um, and so uh, bring your family and y'all just come on to the NFPA conference. It um, is an amazing experience. And uh, we're actually in Las Vegas every other year because it's a very easy destination for folks to get to. And then we want you to stay connected with us. Um, I appreciate so much the CO Trust allowing me to do this webinar with you. It's been my pleasure. But we want to make sure that you get information from us all the time. So we have a network newsletter. And if you scan this QR code, it will ask you, what are you interested in? Public education, building and life safety, fire protection systems. And you can pick. And as a result of that, we will send you one email a month that gives you information around those topics. So we kind of glean everything that comes out in a month. We put it together in one email and on there, you can say um, what you would like to receive from us, how often you'd like to receive information. And it's a great way for you to stay connected with us all year. If you don't wanna scan the QR code, if you go to our webpage and in the search bar, put NFPA um, network newsletter, you can also sign up for it there. And then um, we do have a program called NFPA link. This is a way that you can actually view all of our codes and standards. So if any of you are using our codes and standards, you can sign up for free for two weeks and view it. But it's a great platform that allows you to see and copy and paste our codes and standards, um, to look at content, to share it. And NFPA Link is one of the new platforms that we have. So many of you maybe use, um, may have seen NFPA 72. During the last revision, they added in carbon monoxide alarms in with the smoke alarm and fire protection. So um, it's a great way for you to view our codes and standards if you are using them. And then another emerging topic um, is e-bikes and e-scooters. We have seen many fires in uh, New York has seen the most because of these, but I'm sure that some of your communities may have e-bikes and e-scooters. Um, we launched a micro mobility safety website and on it, it talks about some of the issues that are happening with these e-scooters and e-bikes. So if you go to nfpa.org slash e-bikes, you can go to that webpage and we have videos talking about it. We have a new fact sheet and tip sheet. You'll see it right here that talks about the issues. And a lot of it comes down to safe charging and storing of those um, pieces of equipment. So I did want to mention that. I know it's not directly involved in um, this CR webinar, but it is something that we're seeing evolve across the country. And then I wanted to give you my contact information. Um, there are six of us nationally here in the U.S., and then we have an Air National office. And as part of that, um, we are available to you to answer questions, be a resource, um, and here's my information, and I'm happy to send any questions you have to my colleagues and to be a part of that. But thank you for helping protect this big world.